Um, try to do a Zoom and record again today. So apologize in advance. Uh, I, I did reinstall Zoom, did a little bit of Googling. It looks like it's a known issue possibly for Linux. Zoom isn't too nice on Linux. So it, anyway, if, if it does crash again, I might have to take a five minute break and restart it. Uh, apologies in advance if that keeps happening. I don't think I've got the complete solution yet for that. So. Um, so I hope uh, I've had seen a lot of people do have the the their environment set up and are able to do Jupyter notebooks. Some people I know are still working on it. Um, if you're still working on that, you know, uh, yeah, first assignment is due on uh, Friday. So my main uh, goal today is to talk some more about that. Uh, I've had I, I know some people are working on it, um, so I've got some hints and things. I mostly kind of want to talk um, uh, about. Um, uh, uh, NumPy, so some of the, the things of using NumPy. So, so we will be covering uh, some similar stuff to if you watch the video, but, but I want to go over some of the details of NumPy and also talk about the assignment today. Um, uh, and maybe some various other things. Oh, and, and also show doing the assignment. Uh, maybe I'll start with that. Uh, some people had some questions about, you know, how do you actually submit things, stuff like that, uh, understandably. So, um, um, oh, um, before I get started with that, let me mention, I, I do keep adding resources and fixing things. So I think I fixed all the links for uh, videos like uh, Dr. Ng's lectures and some other stuff, at least for the first two or three units or so. So um, yeah, I was recommending that you start watching at least the getting the, the welcome kinds of stuff and the big overview from Dr. Ng and, and myself uh, this week. Those links should be working. Uh, another thing is, is um, yeah, since I am reorganizing stuff, I did add in, um, there is now um, uh, lecture notebooks, although we won't, uh, from Dr. Ng's class, but we won't um, be getting to that stuff until uh, a week or two later when we get into linear regression and stuff. But uh, those things are up there now, um, um, some other stuff. But uh you will have to do like a git pull. So, so uh, if you clone this repository, you won't see this stuff until you get in there and do a git pull. Uh, so a git pull will re-download any stuff that you don't have yet. All right. So just keep that in mind. Um, um, uh, anytime I mention stuff, if you don't see it on your system, it might be that I added it, but but you just haven't gotten it downloaded onto your local system yet. So. Um. So let me go ahead and start up my own environment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about NumPy and the assignments and things like that. So, oh, for the first assignment, uh, I think I'll start with that. Um, so um, another note, some I've been noticing that this, I think this might be a GitHub Classroom issue. But, uh, but yeah, if you want to start on the assignments, uh, some people have done this already. You do have to go to the assignment link uh, and, and find the, uh, the, the invitation link and click on that. Um, should be able to click on it. Uh, I think I had the same problem last time. Um, um, uh, I, I've, I think there's a, a, a problem with GitHub right now. So for some people after they accept are getting an error message. Hopefully that'll resolve, uh, but uh, that might be ongoing. So yeah, if you haven't accepted the assignment yet and you try it like right now, um, it might do this, but then after it says it's ready and you click on the thing, uh, you might get an error message. So let me know if you continue having problems on that, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to accept the assignment. So uh, once you have an assignment, accept, once you have this first assignment accepted, basically the way you do it is you do, you do need to do a Git clone of the, um, um, so you will have to have your secure shell key set up so that you can clone the SSH URL, right? You, if, if you're not using the VS Code development environment, you can always do this stuff by hand. Um, um, so it's not a requirement that you get it working in VS Code, but it is a requirement that you have a GitHub account, that you can accept these assignments, and that you set up your, you generate a secure shell key and have it um, um, added to GitHub. So let me know if people are still working on that. So. Uh, what that means is um, I, I can always do this by hand. Like at the at the worst, you can always open up a terminal. I'll just do this in like a temporary directory. Um, uh, 
I always I recommend that people, if you're not certain if your secure shell key is working or not, just try that from a terminal uh, secure shell to get at github.com. You should get a successfully authenticated method, message. If, if you don't, something's wrong. You didn't generate your key or you didn't get it correctly up to GitHub. Um, but, um, um, you know, you don't have to do this in VS Code. It's, it's, VS Code has a nice GUI for allowing you to clone and, and make commits and push them. But you can always do this stuff by hand from the command line if you're not using VS Code. Um, so, you know, I can just do a git clone. This will create um, a directory called assignment one, whatever your uh, name is, in the location that you're at. So I've now got a um, repository that I can work on um, in my temp directory um, called uh, that, right? Um, and so if I make a change, so like um, if I make a change to the readme file, and I wanted to push that back, or, or, you know, for you guys, you should make a change by uh, changing the IPython notebook. Um, uh, but just as an example, if I make a change to that file, um, um, you can submit assignments to this class by hand at a minimum using the git, git terminal by uh, um, changing into the directory that has your Git repository. So um, the um, assignment one, in this case, doing like a Git add to uh, stage the file. You might want to Google this instead of trying to remember all the stuff I do, but, but you, know, you have to first stage the file and then you make a commit. Um, and then if you've got, if you're using the SSH correctly, you should be able to push it back up. Uh, and that's when I'll be able to finally see it on GitHub. So if you do that for your assignment one uh, IPython notebook, you can always do it uh, like from a terminal, make a commit and push it up to GitHub. Um, and so I should now see if I look in here on my GitHub classroom repository, uh, if I look at my commits, I should see that that one just came um, where I made a little change to the readme file um, here. All right. Um, but but that's, uh, I'll probably show that in VS Code here as well. I'll bring up the assignment one um, or uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook and maybe do a little bit of work on it uh, again. Um, but um, um, you can do that in VS Code. But the, the general thing, we are using Git. So you have to, to create a commit and get it pushed up here so I can see it uh, and grade it. All right. Um, it's not a good idea to have multiple versions of the repository. So since I just did that, uh, I want to actually use my real repository. Uh, let me go ahead and open that up. So let's get started talking about the assignment uh, a little bit in, in NumPy maybe. Um, so if you do, if you are using the dev, dev environment, and you have everything set up. I'll show this again. So the way I normally do it is I just, um, if I've already cloned the repository, you don't have to clone it again. It, it is dangerous. It's not dangerous, but you know, you can have multiple versions of a repository. Git is meant to be used like in collaboration with other people. So they would have their own clone or local copy. So now that I've made a push, uh, the repository I'm going to open up here, uh, if I want to, avoid having trouble, I'd probably want to pull those down so that I don't end up with any conflicts or anything. So you have to keep that in mind. If, if you're pushing from do, two different places, that's where you get into trouble and start having conflicts, you know, uh, differences between commits and you have to resolve the conflicts uh, and stuff like that. So um, so, uh, so the way I would normally work when I'm using VS Code is I would just reopen the folder. I won't clone it again. Um, so I always keep my repositories in the my repos directory uh, um, under another subdirectory, um, my assignment one here. And I'll uh, reopen in a container. If, if again, if you miss 
the opportunity to reopen in a container. Uh, if you've already created your container, you can use the um, oops, you can use the remote explorer uh, as well. You don't even have to reopen the folder. You can just uh, run the container if it's already created. Um, tell you the truth, I can't remember which one is the one. Oh, it must be this one. Um, or um, I'm just going to, so I've got my folder open, but I want to reopen it in my container so I can run my Jupyter Hub uh, and do the other stuff. So I'll just, uh, another way is you can always, again, default to the command palette and search for like reopen in container um, to uh, ask the dev container extension to reopen the current folder in a container. And, you know, it'll either create, it'll create the container if you've never Create the container for that folder, um, and in either case, then it will reopen uh, all those files uh, inside of that container environment where you need to. So, um, So yeah, I guess I haven't ever done that before. So I was just gonna have to create the container here. Oh, we're almost done. Okay, so I think we're good. And like I showed before, if everything is working, um, you can use this. I don't know if there's a faster or better way, but you can use the nohub file. Uh, it looks like it just depends on there. So my previous uh, runnings are up there as well. So you probably have to go and find the very last um output uh, for the most recent run in order to find the url with the token that you need to, to reopen in here so i mentioned before um, you can also run these notebooks in vs code you just have to install uh the correct extension so you have to install like the um uh, like a python jupyter extension so i was looking at that a little bit so some people might like that uh, as a way of doing things Oh, um, um, but uh, yeah, before I open this up, I should, uh, um, like I was saying, I'm, just to be safe, uh, before I start working on stuff, I don't want to get conflict, so I'll do a git pull here to pull down that push that I did um, in a different repository, so make certain I have exactly all the stuff that's up on the uh, GitHub Classroom here. So. So, um, yeah, if you're doing it like from here um, um, and you're running uh, your assignment one in a container, you'll only have the, um, uh, well, you only have one notebook. <laughs> I've got some others in here because so I was helping some people. But, uh, but yeah, if I make some change on my notebook like this and save it, um, you can also infuse in the VS Code and the containers. You can also use the nice uh, GUI tool to uh, create commits and push them from in there as well. So I could also push my notebook that I just modified um, by creating a commit. I'm going to push it up from here. So you don't always get in VS Code, you don't always get the, um, the message about, you know, you've got a local commit, you want to sync it up. So um, uh, you can look down here at your um, um, your status um, and, uh, uh, and and sync it from there. So this, is, this means here, if you don't know, that um, I don't have anything on the remote, on the GitHub Classroom that needs to be pulled down. I do have one commit locally that hasn't been pushed up yet. So I can uh, uh, click on that to get it pushed up. Um, so now, again, I should have another commit uh, over here. If I look at my commits, uh, where I just pushed the notebook. Right? So that, that's what you do need to do for the assignment. So, And feel free to make multiple commits. So if you get... Task one, uh, the, the first question working, go ahead and commit that up there. Just make certain you have something up there and then work on the, the second question and so on. So I'll just look at the most the last commit when I uh, evaluate stuff. 
Uh, Professor, can you please um, pause this video uh, after the lecture? I will I will try if it doesn't part. crash. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Okay, yeah, so, yeah, uh, I want to talk about the, I'll talk some more about the assignment, oh, and feel free to, you know, yeah, if you have questions or things, I uh, can't guarantee if you're remote uh, that I'll hear or see them, but um, um, uh, I don't have a lot, we did talk about the first one before, um, um, you do have to know a little bit about recursion, uh, kind of the trick on this one is we're using this technique called memoization. So what you're really supposed to use is a dictionary. Um, I don't think I'm giving anything away on that. So um, um, you're supposed to add in like a, um, um, a dictionary. It does it does need to be, you know, it can't be like a local variable that you uh, create inside a function or it won't work. It needs to be something that, that you use that's external because uh, – Call, subsequent calls to the function that the basic idea for memoization is um, uh, we're going to just use a lookup table. So uh, initially, the only thing in the lookup table in your dictionary should just be, um, um, oh, that's the solution. <laughs> I'm, I'm showing you guys a solution there. Didn't really want to do that. Uh, the um, the only thing um, initially in the dictionary, the way that this works, the way I was giving it to you is you should pass in the dictionary um, um, as one of the parameters there. Um, but um, the basic idea is um, um, we only initialize it with the base cases. So if you're asked to, to um, calculate the third Fibonacci number, uh, you would first look in the dictionary. If it's not there, you would have to calculate it. You should use recursion to calculate it. If it is there, you just access the dictionary, pull the value out, and return that. Right. So and then the second time somebody asks, uh, you know, to calculate or return the, the third Fibonacci number, uh, it, it, so when you do have to do the calculation, you should insert it into that dictionary. So, so the next person that needs the third Fibonacci number can just look it up instead of having to redo any of the calculations. So um, if you do that right, you should find that your the efficient version using memoization runs instantaneously instead of taking seconds or minutes uh, to calculate like a big Fibonacci number. Okay. Um, so... Probably most people, the, the most amount of time you'll need will be doing the NumPy stuff. So the second and the third part. Um, I, and I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about NumPy, though, uh, some general things. Um, and then uh, we go in specifically about the questions that you have for the first assignment here. So um, actually, I kind of want to keep that container open. Let me, let me just copy over the, the notebooks. Um, for uh, NumPy here. Um, so I'll just copy over our um, all these unit one and unit two notebooks so I can see them in my assignment container here. And I might have to copy over some data files as well. So, all right. Um, so let me see if this is still running here. Um, that's a, um, a general good hint before you make your commit and push it up. Uh, the final one that you want graded, you might want to, you know, uh, test, check that everything runs cleanly. So it is a common problem that people are not are running the things out of order. So when I try to run your notebook, you've defined stuff that you're actually using uh, before that because you're not running everything from top to bottom on your notebook. So you should always do that for like assignment notebooks. It should run every cell um, 
uh, when you do like a rerun everything. Uh, um, yeah. uh, let's, because I, 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 I mostly in this class take it that, you know, you probably uh, uh, can familiarize yourself with the basis of Python, the stuff that we had as notebooks last week, Python and using functions and stuff like that and uh, dictionaries and things. Uh, but but um, uh, this stuff, like using the, the NumPy library and pandas um, is less likely uh, for most people, many people to uh, be familiar unless you've already done some machine learning or worked with like scikit-learn before or not. So uh, the, you know, there's one library that's the most important to understand in order to use a library like scikit-learn, it is to uh, understand how to use NumPy arrays um, in, in the NumPy library. Um, so um, starting right from the top here, uh, so, so, so the purpose of NumPy is to provide a, uh, uh, a data type, uh, a NumPy array that supports multidimensional arrays um, so basically, these are things that we can do uh, linear algebra like operations with. Okay, so we can have one, two, many dimensional arrays, right? So these are different than lists. Uh, these are much closer to an array in, like in C or Java that you might be uh, used to. So for one thing, when you create a, a NumPy array, all the values in the array are of the same type. Right. So if I create an array, uh, so normally we're just going to be using arrays of doubles or arrays of real valued numbers um, for uh, stuff in this class. So uh, if I create an array uh, in this one, we create an array, we pass it an integer. So all the types are going to be integer. So there's lots of ways you can create arrays uh, for this first assignment. You do have to create a couple of arrays uh, for the for the second question. So, so this stuff right at the top will be relevant to that. So here we'll create an array where we give it 15 integers and we reshape it to have three rows by five columns, right? So most of the stuff we do in this class, we use two dimensional arrays. Um, and, and, nor, and so we always, by convention, we always consider the first one as the number of rows uh, in, in something like this. So, so this is saying that uh, we had 15 values, we're gonna reshape it into a two dimensional array with three rows and, and two columns. So we have two axes, rows and columns, um, um, three rows in this and uh, five separate columns. Right. Um, uh, in machine learning, mostly we use tables like this, uh, two-dimensional arrays. The rows represent uh, a sample or um, 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 like a, uh, so they might represent like a participant and then the columns are different um, data that we collected on that participant. So we might have student, like if we're doing like a psychology experiment, row one might be student one that we ran an experiment with and the columns are like their reaction time on the task and uh, their answer to question A, B, C, and so on, right? So that, that's mostly the, the, the convention. That's, that's the way that we'll be using uh, um, um, arrays in this class. Um, we have samples for rows and the different features that we collected that we wanna make a model of will be the columns in the array, right? Um, so here you can see since we created an array where everything was integers um, and we reshaped it, so now we've got uh, we've got two dimensions, rows and columns, it's a two, two dimensional array of this particular shape, um, and we, we're using integers. Um, so the actual that all the values are integers or sixty four bit integers in this case um, for the um, uh, for this a array. Um, Um, and you can create more complex. So, you know, an example here where we're creating a three-dimensional array. Um, so the way that you normally think of this, I don't think we'll use this much in this class after uh, the examples of learning NumPy, but here we've got uh, a set of, of um, what, five tables that are four rows and three columns is one way to think of a three-dimensional array like this. So, so there's five separate of these. All these are each... Uh, um, um, four rows by three columns. Um, let me skip ahead here. There's lots of... Uh, 
lots of different ways you can create things. Um, okay, so let's kind of start with this. Um, so one of the powerful things of using NumPy arrays is we can operate on them in vectorized ways. So uh, if, if you haven't done stuff with NumPy or, or maybe Mat, uh, MATLAB, I think MATLAB was the first software that kind of popularized this way of, of doing programming. Um, so most people refer to this as doing ve vectorized calculations or vectorized operations. So uh, what that means is if, if I wanted to, um, um, like what we're doing here, if I wanted to subtract 10 from all the values in this two-dimensional array, if you're using like C or Java, you have to write a loop or, or probably a nested loop. So I can go over each row and each column, access the individual value, subtract 10 from it and save it back in there, right? So, so uh, in, in languages that don't support uh, accessing things in a vectorized way, I have to write loops to do all the work. In, in this kind of vectorized way of doing stuff, I can write expressions like this, right? And this allows you to much more complexly um, express operations over whole arrays. Um, and later on, we'll see, I mean, it basically allows you to take um, 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 things from like linear algebra, mathematical expressions from linear algebra and directly express them as code instead of having to re-express them as a bunch of loops uh, to do all the stuff I need to do in them, right? So uh, the most basic vectorization is if I do something with a scalar value. So now we kind of make a difference between uh, things that are non-scalar, which really just means an n-dimensional array versus things that are just a single value. So if you see uh, people refer to a scalar, that's just a fancy name for a regular variable, a variable that holds a single value. So anytime I perform a, an operation between uh, an n-dimensional array and a scalar, it applies, by default, it applies that to all the values in the array, right? So the effect is we subtract 10 from all, all the values in this two-dimensional array here. Uh, and, and all of the scalars for all of the arithmetic operations are supported, multiplication, division, uh, raising to a power, um, and so on, right? So, um, um, all the functions in, um, um, in the NumPy library support vectorized operations. So also if I need to do, uh, you know, do the sign of all the values in, in dimensional array or get the absolute value of them, so on. Um, uh, if you're, you know, there is a separate math library in Python that works on scalar values or regular like Python lists and stuff. So if you need to do signs or other stuff, you should use the NumPy versions of them um, on a NumPy array. Right? Um, but we can do even more, right? So we don't have to do operate vectorized operations between an array and a scalar. We could do uh, array array operations as well, and those have meanings uh, in NumPy. So there are some restrictions. So usually they have to have the same number of values in there. So they have to be the same shape, or not necessarily the same shape, but the the, the total number of values in there have to be the same. Um, uh, to do sometimes to do things like this, right? So um, if the, the, the arrays uh, are of the same shape, I can add them together um, and that will do what you expect. Um, so since I have two one-dimensional arrays or vectors here, um, uh, it'll just sum them up. So the result is just uh, summing uh, each um, item in the index. If I have uh, two-dimensional arrays, um, um, if we do multiplication, uh, here, a, a note, I think this is what's being discussed here, is by default, this does element by element um, multiplication. It's not doing matrix multiplication, right? So you, you can use another function. In fact, uh, they overload. So in, in version three of Python, more, you know, more recent versions of NumPy, if you want matrix multiplication, you can use the at sign, or you can just use the dot function. Right? But, but matrix multiplication is different from... Uh, element-wise uh, product or element-wise multiplication. Right? Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need matrix multiplication if we're doing linear algebra. Um, so this is an important, um, I think I have a separate lecture uh, video kind of showing vectorized, doing vectorized stuff. 
in Python. But uh, understanding that allows you to write, to take expressions like this, you know, uh, if we're trying to implement some machine learning, uh, learning algorithm or something like that, uh, and almost directly uh, translate that into a vectorized NumPy code. Right? So if I have a function of X um, that can, that's complex, we're, we're you know, taking sines and raising the powers and cosines and stuff like that. Um, uh, now, if, if X is an array, is, is an in-dimensional um, NumPy array, and it doesn't have to be some, doesn't have to necessarily be a vector. Although uh, in this case, we'll think of it as as a vector, right? So what we're doing here is um, where is X? So, so we create using the Lin space. Um, we create our X uh, n-dimensional array here. So X. Uh, let me see if I still have X here. That's Oh, that's, that looks like the same one, right? So this is just uh, an array from negative four to four of a thousand values, evenly spaced, linearly spaced uh, in this case. So if we look at the shape of X, so this means, again, you should be familiar with this notation here. Um, this is saying that uh, there's one dimension. So whenever you have uh, something that's a vector, mathematically we call it one dimensional array, a vector. Um, this has one dimension, uh, there's a thousand values in the one dimension of the array. That, that was created from doing the Lin space here. Right? So if I want to see what this complex function looks like over the range from negative four to four, I don't have to have a loop um, that, that executes a thousand times to apply all these operations, right? Uh, we can directly express it like this. And um, since all of the operations, um, well, we have to use sine and cosine from the NumPy library, because those are vectorized versions of sine and cosine function, but the others like addition and uh, so on. So, you know, again, if you don't understand what's going on there, you can break it down one by one. So um, um, like if I do X squared, so I have the values X. So, you know, if we're doing X squared, it's applying, it's squaring each of the values. So negative four becomes 16, so on, right? So if we're looking like that, it would apply all the stuff in parentheses first. So we, it, the result from doing that is another array of the same shape, but applying the square to it. So, so um, when we do this here, the result is a, a vector of a thousand values with the value squared. The result of this is a vector of so on. And then we add these together um, and it, um, it does what you would expect, but without having to do any looping and stuff. So if I don't remember, I did it. Yeah. On this assignment for the third question, if you find yourself reaching to do a loop uh, you, you do have to have one loop to exit, to calculate each of the time steps, but otherwise you should be using vectorized operations. Um, so for this assignment or future assignments, uh, usually you should not be doing a loop um, you know, to calculate the square of all the values in X. Um, you should be um, using NumPy um, and, and doing them in vectorized ways. So, and this is an example of plot. If, if you haven't gone through the uh, lecture on plotting, um, I don't know if I'll talk about uh, plotting or visualization today. We will use it, but that's not really the, you know, the purpose of this course, but we will do a lot of simple plots, right? So at the most basic here, uh, if you ask matplotlib to plot, uh, if you give it two arrays of the same size, um, um, it'll take these as the x values. So that's the original, you know, from negative four to four, a thousand points evenly spaced. Um, and it will plot all the values um, uh, that was calculated from this function, um, this complex function here, right? So we get something really wiggly in that range from negative four to four. So this is a visualization of the function. This, this is just an approximation. So if, if, if you watch my video on, you know, doing vectorized operations like this, you know, one, one good thing to understand is um, if, for example, I only uh, do, let's say, 50 values in the range from negative four to four. Um, so now X has 50 values in space in the same range, but we have much less value. So, so the, uh, the grid 
um, is much more sparse that we're going to use to plot and uh, visualize this function here, right? So the result is, is, is if you don't make your thing dense enough, we're really only approximating this function. So, you know, if, if you're not paying attention, it might look like it's uh, not so uh, smooth, but the real function is actually smooth. It's just, we're not using a dense enough estimation. Um, um, so we end up seeing the line segments that's actually connecting all the points um, in our visualization of the, of the function here. So I think on the second assignment, um, uh, you might run into that for some things. Um, um, so you, have to, you do have to kind of know what's happening there. You have to make certain you use something that's dense enough so you can see the real shape of the functions that you're using. But you, I mean, you know, the, the, you know, my screen only has a thousand, two thousand pixels across that. So, so usually a couple thousand points. Um, is enough. You won't be able to get any more detail um, if you get more points than that when you do a plot like this. Okay. Um, Let's go up to indexing slicing. Um, so you need to use this for the first assignment a little bit, I think. Um, so the basics, we, we talked about this last time, I mean, you can uh, index these arrays as you would expect, and we are using zero-based indexing. So if I ask for the value of index two, that's actually the third element uh, in this array here. So this array has, um, uh, 10 elements um, from 0 to 9. So the A range will give us uh, integers 0 to 9. Uh, we take the cube of them, um, and that ends up being our array A. So that gets the element in index 2, but you can do that kind of slicing, which we'll need to do a lot uh, for this class for various reasons. So that gets the elements from 2 up to, but not including 5. So it gets the, the second, third, and fourth one. Um, you can use step sizes, right? Um, you can iterate over the values in an array. So, you know, it's relatively simple if you just have a one dimensional array, it's it more complex to think about, you know, what you're doing and what you need to do once you have two or, or especially if you have more higher dimensional than, than uh, a two dimensional array that you want to kind of slice into. Um, um, but yeah, so for a two-dimensional array, you, you can pass in, uh, so the simplest one is, you know, I can get one particular value. So that, the one at row two, column three, where we, again, we are always zero indexing these things. So this would be considered row zero, row one, and row two, this is column zero, column one, column two, column three. So, so row two, column three, actually it's the 15 there. Um, but you can, you know, um, yeah, you can use, instead of a particular one, pull out a slice from any dimension or all dimensions. So here we're only getting columns two through two up to four. So column two and three, column number two and three, um, but all rows. So, uh, I'm sorry, a row two and three, uh, but all columns in, in the row two and three. Um, okay, and I'm sure I have this in here somewhere, but uh, I did want to explicitly mention this. So one of the things for the third problem, uh, so do be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, so let's see if I still have, do I still have my um, B here? So we still have B, uh, which has those values in it. Um, and it's a, um, a five rows by four column uh, matrix here. So um, if you do something like um, 
Uh, like we just did above, but uh, maybe I'll give another example. So if I want all rows, but uh, just the, say the first two columns, um, something like that, right? So, so the first one is the rows, so I get all the rows, uh, but just column zero and one um, in this case. So that should just give me the two columns resulting in something that's what, um, um, uh, five rows by two columns uh, shaped uh, item here, right? But uh, be careful, C is really only a view into um, B here. So if I do something like say C um, at row uh, one, column one, that's 42, It'll do what you expect, right? So, so we, we took the one at row one, row, row one, column one, uh, and changed its value by doing the assignment in there. But since C is only a view in the B, if, if you you might be surprised to see that um, if you look at B, it actually got changed in there as well. So whenever you th this is a performance thing, right? So that's not the way that lists. So so mostly lists and other data types. In the base language, if you make a copy or slice like that, uh, um, uh, or an assignment, it will actually copy the values or it will pass pass them by value if you're passing them into a function. So that means that if you make a slice and you change it on a list, it's not going to be changing the original one. But you know, NumPy arrays normally they're going to have thousands or millions. They're going to be big. They have lots of values. So uh, if I do a slice like that, um, I don't want to have to copy potentially a very large B um, uh, to create this new C. It'll just be um, a, a new view into those same memory values, the, uh, the, um, um, the first two columns of B there, right? So anything I do to C, uh, we'll actually see it in B. Uh, same thing for passing a function. So for the third, um, question for the assignment, if you pass in an array, a NumPy array to a function, if you modify that array in the function, it, it's not getting passed in by value. It's not a copy. It's a view. It, it's a reference to the NumPy array that you pass in. So if you change that array, when you return from the function, you're going to find that, that the NumPy array got changed. Uh, and a lot of times you don't want to do that, right? If you pass something into a function, you still want your array when you return from it the way it was. You just want that function to work with the array. So um, you do have to correctly, uh, uh, if you don't want to change an array that's passed in a function, you have to copy, explicitly cause the, the uh, arrays to be copied so that you're not changing the original one um, that was called with it, right? Um, So, you know, let me know um, if people want me to cover other stuff, have questions about things as I go over these. Um, um, so that's an important thing, indexing, slicing. Uh, you should be comfortable with that. Um, um, another thing that is going to be useful for question two and three are uh, being able to uh, uh, do some advanced indexing, some some um, uh, advanced indexing or some Boolean indexing uh, with these arrays, okay? So, um, so yeah, a real simple example, what, what is normally meant by fancy indexing or, or indexing with arrays of indices uh, is something like this. So the, the simplest to understand um, is if I have, in this case, it's actually just a regular uh, Python list. You can also use an NumPy array. But here we create a list with indexes 1, 3, and 4. Um, and B, well, actually, I modified it above there. But um, um, if B is still those values there, uh, if I do something like that, um, um, it will just get uh, rows 1, 3, and 4. Right? So it gets the, the first one uh, and then the last two rows out there, right? So we're using these as index numbers for the rows, right? Uh, and I didn't mention before, but um, um, let me see if my B is still, so my B is still, oh, I recreated it there, right? So, so my B still has these values, my B currently has these values in it right here. 
Um, I, I didn't mention it before, but um, um, when you're working with two or, or three or higher dimensional arrays, you can you can emit any index that you want to, and it assumes you want all of them. So what? So if I want just uh, row one, if I do that, uh, you know, the first dimension is always the row, the second is the columns if it's two dimensional. So that means just give me row one. Um, so I, I don't have to say um, um, uh, the, the row at index one, so three, four, seven, twelve. Uh, and this is covered up there if you read through this complete notebook. If, if I want um, uh, the first, uh, uh, the, the, the second two rows, so row one and two, I can do that, right? I'm just omitting the second dimension. Right? Um, this is equivalent to, I can specify the second dimension um, and use a colon. That will get all of the columns, uh, row one and two, but all the columns in those rows. Right. But yeah, you know, so if I want actually columns, I can't skip that. So I have to say I want all the rows, but just columns uh, uh, um, one through three. Yeah, right. So so you know, if I only want some particular ones from the first dimension, um, then I don't have to specify. It'll get all of the ones from the second. Dimension. But if I want uh, all the one, all the rows, but some particular columns, and we have to specify something like that. Right. Same goes if it's three dimensional or four dimensional. I can, I can, any dimensions that you don't specify, it'll get all of those values in those dimensions uh, that are embedded. Right. So, anyway, yeah, so that gets all the rows, uh, but um, um, the columns one and two, these two columns here. So uh, anyway, that's all that's kind of happening here. Uh, but instead of specifying the slice, I'm passing in a list. So we end up getting row one, three, and four uh, when we do this. Um, and here it shows, right, if I want to get, uh, you know, particular columns, um, I can ask for column zero and two using what we were just talking about but I'm passing the list of the indexes. So, so I want the, the zeroth column and the second column in this case. Right. And you can specify both of those at the same time. Um, it can sometimes be uh, difficult to, to figure out ahead of time what's going to happen when you do that. Um, and we won't do a lot of that. Uh, um, often, as long as you understand this, this basic idea, it's sometimes you need particular rows or particular columns. So, uh, that will work with NumPy arrays. It'll kind of work with pan if you have a pandas data frame as well. Uh, you can do a, a similar kind of idea. So, the fourth question is about pandas data frame. I don't know if I'll talk about that today, but maybe we could talk a little bit about pandas uh, on Thursday. We still have Thursday as well this week. So, um, So yeah, there's there's even more complex stuff you can do. But um, the other, um, you can also do what's known as Boolean indexing. Um, and um, a lot of people don't seem to be uh, uh, aware that this, this could be very useful for the problem two and the problem three uh, for this assignment uh, to make things easier to understand. So Boolean indexing works something like this. Um, so uh, again, because of, of this way of doing, thinking of doing vectorized operations, I can also, you know, not only do arithmetic, arithmetic but I can do logical operations as well. Um, and it does what you expect. So uh, here, if I want to find uh, which values are divisible by three, um, uh, so we've got B, let me see if B is still that array. So B is this array. So the ones that are divisible by three are uh, nine, th three, six, nine, so on. So um, so the, the percent is the remainder, right? So th this is going to be one. Uh, this is going to be zero for anything that's divisible by three. So all these values in this column are divisible by three, but none of these values are divisible by three. So really only the first and third columns are the powers of three are divisible by three here, right? Including zero, zero, zero divisible by three. So um, if I want to... So, so again, that's a vectorized operation. So the result is 
um, the result of finding the remainder uh, element wise for all those. This also becomes a vectorized operation. Uh, since we're using a Boolean operator, um, it's basically going to give me true everywhere. This is zero, so true everywhere. The number was divisible by three uh, and false everywhere where it was not divisible by three. Right. Um, so that's what's shown here. Right. But these things are nice because you can use these. We, I think of these as like a mask, and that's what we call it for the, uh, the, the assignment that you're working on for this week here. So you can use this kind of a, a Boolean uh, vectorized operations to get a set of Boolean values and apply that as a mask to only get some particular values in an array that you're interested in, uh, like maybe accessing or manipulating. Right? So, um, so yeah, like we show here, uh, and if it's easier to understand, we could have done something like this. So, um, All right, so all I'm doing is creating this Boolean array. Uh, that's the same shape as B, but it's true everywhere. Uh, the value was divisible by three and false everywhere where it's not, right? And I'm assigning that into another array called mask here. Um, so uh, you can apply, as long as this is the same shape, um, so, so mask is the same shape as B, uh, so I can pass that in. It will only return back the values that were true in my Boolean index here. Right? So basically everything that was divisible by three comes out. Right? And as I was showing here, I mean, you know, you can put that into a separate mask or you can just do it directly um, like we were doing. Um, same thing. Right? But even further, the the, the thing that some people miss, I think, is I can use that to only affect those values, right? So if I want to do something and reassign it back in there, so make certain I still have my mask. So if I still have this Boolean mask, if I want to do something, if I want to change all the things that are divisible by three, um, uh, make them a hundred times bigger, I can do something like that, right? Pull out the things that are divisible by three, that are you know that are in my mask, they're true in my mask. Only multiply those things by a hundred. And, and again, it's important you can't just assign this back into V. B. This this is an array of that shape now after we boolean mask it or boolean index it. So uh, this assigns it back into those same locations where the mask is true. All right. The result of that, right? So you have to do some similar stuff on this assignment. A lot of people use like np where or other functions. Those will work too, as long as you understand them and do them right. Uh, but I usually find it better to just understand Boolean indexing because what you're using, what you're doing, especially for the third question, is only the values that have uh, uh, grown too big, whose absolute value is gr grown above some threshold. Only those should be. Um, um, set to the current timestamp. Um, right? So you, you can use Boolean indexing and maybe, uh, maybe understand a little bit easier than uh, trying to do some other stuff for that question. All right. Any questions or stuff? So those are some of the big things um, on the NumPy that I, I think will explicitly help with this, this assignment here. Um, so let me go back to the assignment here. I still got 15 minutes. Um, so, uh, you know, on this first part, this is really meant to, if, if you do these correctly, you're going to be re reusing these concepts to, to make this function work on the second part here. Uh, so uh, I don't know, some, some things to be careful about uh, here. I, mean, I do give you kind of what the output should be when you do the, all these. So we start out, out by asking you to create some arrays of particular shapes with particular values in them. So the X and the Y. So do be careful here. This is not 
Um, this is not a one-dimensional array. This is a two-dimensional array. Hopefully I made that explicit here. So a two-dimensional array with one row uh, and five columns. Um, I can tell, um, yeah, it's, supposed to, it's actually supposed to be two-dimensional with one row and five columns. That's not the same as a one-dimensional array, a vector with just five values in it. All right. So anyway, a lot of, some people miss that. And likewise, here is a little bit easier to see because this one is supposed to be a two-dimensional array. But uh, again, we've got two dimensions, rows and columns, but we've only got one column and four rows here on this one. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I kind of skipped over, but you can use some of the stuff from that notebook to do things like tiling. So you can use that to build up. Um, um, uh, this was the top function or some other things. Um, so um, in the uh, the function for uh, the the third question, third problem, um, you do have to create this mask. Uh, it needs to be the same shape. Um, as as Z, so you know, um, so we practice doing the similar thing, creating a, um, a mask. So you can use uh, various things to do something like that. You, you can uh, another if you look in the notebook, uh, you can always create an array the same shape as some reference one. Uh, what's the name of that function? So, so there is like a function where you say, "Give me a new array the same shape as this." other array and initialize it to these values. So that's, that's an easy one to use to do stuff like this. Init create an array of the same shape as something else, initialize all to true, things like that. Um, all right, and then... Um, you know, I'll mention that, uh, so we are performing this calculation. So we're, you know, you should do this in a vectorized way. So this um, here and also in problem three, you shouldn't have a loop in there where you're taking Z and, and looping through to square all the values. You should just use NumPy vectorized operations. But you're supposed to apply this little uh, quadratic where you element-wise square all the current values in, in Z, uh, add the, the C array to it that should be of the same shape and reassign that back into Z. Uh, the result of that is, is the values in Z will be growing. Uh, once they grow above an absolute value of two, you're su they're supposed to fall out of this Julia set here, right? So, um, so that's kind of what the purpose of, of uh, where we asked to, where is it? Uh, 